The Essential Personalized Learning Team at the Center for Collaborative Education welcomes you to our webinar on competency-based lear learning, the fourth in our five-part series, Getting Personalized Learning Right. We at CCE believe that personalized learning, when implemented the right way, is the key to academic success and educational equity. That said, in our extensive work supporting schools through the process of design and redesign, we have also seen the perils and pitfalls of this work that are all too easy to stumble into. We hope that this webinar series serves as an opportunity to share what we have learned about how to approach personalized learning so that it meets its intended equitable student outcomes and is sustainable for the school community. My name is Diana LeBeau, and I'm the director of the Essential Personalized Learning Team at Center for Collaborative Education. Aside from my time as director and previously senior associate at CCE, I have been a school administrator, an educational program director, a middle school teacher, and a curriculum development manager. In my role at CCE, I've worked with schools to develop and plan around competencies, and I've also brought competency-based learning and enrichment education, often in partnership with schools. Although I have worked in cities in Maine, New York, Missouri, and Massachusetts, my work has always focused on providing equitable learning opportunities for young people, particularly those from marginalized communities that can most benefit from targeted, personalized learning. Our guest speaker today, Gary Chapin, works on our Quality Performance Assessment Team at QPA. Um, at CCE, rather, <laughs> focusing on practices, policy, and strategic efforts to create systems of assessments that are truly equitable. In this role, he supports teachers and educators at every level of practice to implement performance assessment systems. He was the founding researcher and developer of the Maine Department of Education's Center for Best Practice, where he conducted case studies of several districts engaged in transformative work around proficiency-based, or what we would call competency-based, learner-centered practices. So he's really seen competency education in action. He has spoken at several conferences and has co-authored several publications, including Creating Proficiency-Based Learner-Centered Systems in 2014. And now, I'd love to hear about you. Please introduce yourself and your interest in joining us today via the chat feature, which you'll find on your webinar screen. I'll give you a minute to do this, and then we can regroup. I want to make sure that this seminar is beneficial to those who are here with us today. All right, you can continue to respond if you haven't already. It does look like we have some folks from Rhode Island in the house and some more local folks, and one or two people from a little further away, so that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing, and um, you can continue to use this chat feature to ask any questions that might come up over today's session. And we'll read these aloud as part of our question and answer session later. If you're new to this series, our vision of personalized learning strives for sustainable, equitable, school-wide change. Our framework for personalized learning is based on five principles. Dispositions for learning, authentic learning, flexible learning, student-driven learning, and the focus of today's session, competency-based learning. Although we are focusing on one principle at a time, we feel strongly that these principles work best in concert, supported by the right conditions for learning, which you can see in that outer circle, and um, that would include leadership, professional learning, autonomy, technology, and family and community engagement. And no matter what, we want to see all of these focus on equity and excellence for college, career, and life. This chart might help demonstrate that particular way in which our principles, our focus on equity, and our systems of support are intended to work together. We feel rather strongly that any missing piece will lead to challenges at the implementation level, many of which might result in inequities which often mar the image of personalized learning. It's tough to do this well if we don't bring all these pieces together. You'll see in this chart that competency-based learning is 
an essential component because it marries personalized learning with the accountability world that we live in. You might say that it provides a much needed framework for learning that moves outside of the traditional box. Here are our essential questions about competency-based learning. Um, how do we implement a true competency-based curriculum in which students progress as they demonstrate proficiency rather than students progressing at the same rate according to grade level? And what would grades, report cards, and transcripts look like in a competency-based system? And what support can we offer to ensure that all students are progressing, possibly in different ways and at different rates, toward demonstrating proficiency of challenging, rigorous, and standards-aligned competencies? And finally, how do we ensure that competency-based learning eliminates rather than perpetuates equity gaps? The first few questions I'll get to right away, and the last few will be the focus of the last part of this webinar. And this is more specifically the questions that I hope we're going to cover in today's session. I'm going to begin by laying the groundwork for 15 minutes or so about what competency-based learning is, followed by some time for Gary to talk about how competency education really looks in schools and districts. Then I'll spend some time talking through some, some of the common equity challenges we see related to competency-based learning. I actually have some concrete stuff for you there. And I'll end with a chance for the questions and answers that I hope that you write in the chat box throughout the presentation. Oh, you know what, the title of this slide was incorrect. I apologize for that. <laughs> It should say competency-based learning, um, but competency-based learning, by our definition, is when students move toward targets called competencies, which are high and broad goals that represent key concepts and skills applied within and across content domains. They enable flexibility by providing multiple opportunities to demonstrate mastery. I think one assumption of competency-based learning is that this allows a common, high set of goals but does not demand a particular pace. And in some cases, it doesn't even require a particular sequence. Instead of in traditional education where everything happens at a particular time but the outcomes vary on the student level, in competency-based learning, it's the pace that varies as well as the particular approach students take to learning and to demonstrating mastery. The last bullet here um, about equitable outcomes is something that we're going to look at more closely later in the webinar. So there are a lot of terms that get muddled about in this world. Um, our term competency-based learning is what we see as an inclusive term. If you've heard of competency-based progression, about a sequence of competencies at different paces, this is folded in to competency-based learning. So is the separate but important aspect of grading, which we'll talk about in a minute. And proficiency, too, you might say that this is another term that means roughly the same thing. In fact, some states or organizations prefer to call competency-based learning proficiency-based education or even mastery learning. They're pretty much interchangeable, although I think sometimes people focus on the connotation of one term over another. I wanted to clear that up right away because I know some of you are joining us from states where the terminology might be different. I know even though in Massachusetts we tend to use competency-based learning, many of our neighbors prefer proficiency learning. All right, so I want to introduce our approach to competency-based learning by going through some key considerations. If you're thinking about bringing competency education to your school or district or even at the classroom level, for those of you who are teachers joining us, these are some of the chief things to think about in planning for that move. If you're really not sure yet, I think this will still be crucial because I'd argue that these are often the main reasons to consider moving in that direction. So 
This is the first of the key considerations, what we might term competency-based progression. So the competency is the basic unit of progress. It's not a chapter in a book, not a specific class, not a grade level. It's all about achieving competencies to progress. And students progress upon mastery of a competency, regardless of what the other students in their class or grade are doing, and regardless of how they're doing with the other competencies. Some students might move very quickly through some competencies, while they might move more slowly through others. Now, for personalized learning to happen, learning must be based on these competencies. And the school must provide tightly aligned assessments that would allow students the opportunity to demonstrate mastery on these competencies. I know this is probably setting off some alarm bells. How can we possibly let students move at their own pace without going crazy? But we will dive into this part later, I promise. Um, for now, just keep in mind that this is a fundamental aspect of competency education. Now, the alignment part seems really simple. Alignment is this idea that everything from the competency to the student work is all aligned, meaning it's aiming toward the same goal. In other words, all elements of instruction and assessment support the student learning the content, the knowledge, the skill, the disposition of that competency at the level of cognitive rigor demanded by that competency. So competencies tend to be pretty broad, but no matter whatever the competency is and how it's articulated, it really needs to be aligned with all of these other components at the school level. When I talk to parents who are nervous about competency-based reporting, they're always concerned about grades. How will they know what a one or a four means? They're used to the A to F or a number grade, percentage, and what does this mean for colleges? But I actually think that's one of the easiest cells, if you put it the right way. All of a sudden, parents can know exactly where their kids need support and exactly where their kids are already mastering their work. And from an outside perspective, you know that every single graduate has demonstrated proficiency in all areas as opposed to some high scores masking some areas of weakness, which would happen in a more traditional system. This is an example of that. Um, if you average a grade, which is what most traditional schools do, especially over time, it doesn't really tell the story of a student's learning. Look at this example of three different students here. One kid throughout the entire unit got 385 for three different assignments. That's going to wind up with an 85 average on that child's report card. Second student in that class might get a 75, an 85, and really doing quite well on one assignment gets a 95. Again, that's an 85 average. All of these, and you'll see the next student, it's a different uh, order, 95, 85, 75. They all wind up with the 85 average, and you have no way of knowing which students have done well in which areas without digging more deeply. That's what competencies and competency-based learning is supposed to help unmask. You could even have a situation where students failed, according to the school, in certain areas and absolutely excelled in others. And their grade is going to look like they're a middle-of-the-road student, even though they were really excelling in some areas and really struggling in others. Okay, another thing to lay out is the difference between what I think many people are a little more familiar with, standards-based education, and competency-based education. I could spend a lot of time talking through the semantic distinctions, but I wanted to quickly show you a comparison between these two approaches to teaching and learning as well as grading. So I think one chief difference is that competencies are broader and more universal goals that do not dictate specific content. They are the kind of broad goals that different content could address in different ways. Um, usually, school-wide competencies are limited to five or eight at the most, 
and maybe specific departments, say the math department or the science department at a school, might choose three to five departmental competencies. This array of competencies would be what the school would require of all students prior to graduation. Um, this allows for more personalization and multiple means of assessment because if we had, you know, 150 competencies for each student, it would be a little trickier to get more personalized and allow students to attack the content in different ways. Um, the other thing about competency-based education is it's, it's not necessarily limited to the classroom. In some states, they're already exploring letting students get credit for learning that occurs outside of the classroom, as long as they can demonstrate that learning, either to their teacher, some other designated person in their school or district, um, or even to an outside agency that's trusted by the district, they're able to get credit for achieving competency in areas that have nothing to do with what they learn within the four walls of their classroom. The other thing about competency-based education is that it's about more than just a list of skills or objectives. It's all about the progression. It's about really working towards deep mastery and, and understanding of something. So you see this contrast with standards-based education where I think one of the chief differences is there's a lot of very specific standards and as a result, it would be much trickier for teachers to allow for students to really drive their own learning. It's also a lot harder to let some of this learning happen outside of the classroom. The support required for students in order to do competency-based learning well will be our focus after Gary speaks, but in summary, competency-based learning is an elegant and simple idea that seems obvious, but it does have some serious implications and demands. In a personalized, competency-based system, the school must provide a comprehensive system of scaffolding and student support so that every student can demonstrate proficiency. Um, and this support is a huge part of how to do this equitably. So we'll, we'll be talking again about pacing, we'll be talking about that kind of scaffolding and support, after I've given Gary a chance to chat with you all. And with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Gary, who will be digging into the implementation side with some examples and how this really looks at the school and district level. You're on, Gary. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Gary Chapin at the Center for Collaborative Education and um, before I was before I was at the Center for Collaborative Education, I was at the main Department of Education doing work on on what at the time was called standards based or proficiency based um, policy and grading and implementation in schools. I went all over the I went all over the state and before that, I was a curriculum director at um, RSU 16, the home of Poland Regional High School, which in Maine is a famously proficiency um, proficiency based school, and had been since it was founded in in um, 1999. And then before that, I was at RSU two, which is which was Haldale, which is where um, which which made the transition while I was there, and I was I was doing I was the teacher leader curriculum person. Not to get too formal on you, um, and and really that became the focus of a lot of my of my work there, helping make the transition in the high school, especially to a, a standards based system. So uh, we've learned a lot since then, and most of what I'm going to tell you, it, it will be lessons drawn from the field. So. Uh, Laura, can we have the next slide, please? So the essential question is, how can you successfully engage an infinitely varied set of stakeholders? And I'm only, only a little bit of hyperbole there, infinitely varied set of stakeholders. When we're talking about teachers, parents, students, et cetera, it's, it's more than just a comp, uh, communications plan. There's, there's definitely a way of being that helps it happen. 
And then the second essential question is, how can you do that in a way that is sustainable? So by sustainable, I'm using Gordon Donaldson's definition of sustainable uh, leadership, which is leadership that doesn't kill the leader. So um, that's that's sustainable. You can't can't be burning out your staff. And click, please. And then, so in addition to skills and techniques involved in public outreach um, that have that have made this possible in the schools where it's successful. Uh, there's also something which I'm for the moment calling an engagement mindset. I don't know if I'm going to stay with that, uh, but this engagement mindset for in order to successfully transform schools and institutions, and it's also essential for the well-being of the teachers and leaders. Next. So I want to start with a few words about the role of leadership. And by leadership, I'm not specifically talking about the named leaders. I probably don't have to say that at this point, but leadership wherever it's happening. Next. So uh, the importance of leadership, uh, a pack of donkeys led by a lion can do much more than a pack of lions led by a donkey, which is a 12th century Mongol proverb. I don't know if they're actually called proverbs, but maybe an aphorism, I'm not sure. Next. And there's your 12th century Mongol. And that's actually Genghis Khan, who uh, I'm not suggesting be your model for leadership, but it's still a really nice, a really nice proverb. Next. Uh, so Ronald Heifetz is sort of the hero of my work. Um, and he wrote a book called Leadership Without Easy Answers. And this quote is really encapsulates to me what we are trying to do. Uh, the, and it's leadership is mobilizing people to contend and wrestle with adaptive challenges where there is a gap between their values and where they live and operate. And the reason why this is my, my favorite and the reason why it's so important to this work is because the work that you're doing, shifting to a competency-based system from a traditional system you're not doing that just because you'll get better test scores. You're not doing that just because there will be more clarity. Um, you're not doing it just out of a sense of utility or efficiency. Uh, you're doing it because a competency-based system reflects a set of values that a traditional system does not. And the values of a traditional system are, are to sort students to to where they to the, the to the to the level of their demonstrated um well the idea is that it's to the level of their demonstrated skill but then why are why do warehouse workers have children who become warehouse workers but a competency-based system uh is designed with the value of bringing each kid up to their highest level and um so I think that every teacher that I know would say, yes, of course, we should bring kids up to their highest levels. That is that is a value for me. That is a moral value. But the systems that we work in, where we live and operate, does not support that value. So um, I bring this up because in your work trying to implement this, it was so important to, 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 to continuously think about why are we doing this? Next, please. So uh, before I start with this stuff, I'm gonna suggest that you all write down that Earl uh, simply because um, there's so much information there um, that it's, it's insane. Um, so in 2012, uh, between 2012 and 2014, I was at the Maine Department of Education and I created the Center for Best Practice. And we did a series of, of, of case studies of six different, uh, five districts and one educational collaborative. And so, so those have been written up. Um, they're very good. If you like case studies, um, I think they're entertaining. Uh, but they're also, each of them is like 25 pages long, but they're, each of them also has a, um, 
a two page summary so you can you can go and also there are a set of videos there that are that are really charming they're two or three minute videos and i say they're charming because they feature the kids mostly and uh our kids are charming um so but in this in these case studies and then in the work that i've been doing with the center for collaborative education since the things that if you if you're trying to sh shift to a competency-based system there are five things that we found people had to keep in mind to do it these these come up again and again and they came up often in the case studies and they've come up with so many districts we've been working with and states since then so the five things are we'll talk about each of them in detail in a moment uh cultural change remembering that this is a cultural change uh technological support um the idea that technology won't create a great system but bad technology can sure ruin a good system uh the finances and professional development you have to have training for your teachers and somehow it's got to be paid for uh policy and leadership and it's like similar to technology uh a great policy won't make a great system but a bad bad policy can really ruin it and then the vision and, and the framework the overall uh, articulated vision of the school next please so engagement and communication is pretty interesting um in every case i talk to and, and this could come up again and again and again uh participants talked people talked about the challenge of bringing everybody in as partners rather than just um, like, let's bring the parents in and tell them what we're doing, or uh, let's send out a memo to the teachers. This is a weakness of administrators who are, who are structurally based. They're very north, if you know your compass points. Um, they feel like if it's like the holy grail is if I just write the right memo, then everything will be okay. So, but that's not, that doesn't bring in people as partners. And so um, the districts that have been successful with this haven't been top down, but they also haven't been just grassroots. And so there's, there's um, sort of a, a way of thinking about it where we talk about the grassroots and the gardener. So the leaders are the gardener. And the reason this is important is because if you think about it, uh, the gardener cannot make the tomatoes grow. Um, the gardener creates the conditions within which the tomatoes grow. But the tomatoes have something to say about it all along, and, it, and that cannot be denied. So it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of a partnership, and it's an important analogy because the way we think of relationships, whether it's, it's a war or a competition, or gardening in the gardener uh, affects uh, how you how you work with them. Um, so I'm gonna leave that there. By the way, anybody who has any questions, please feel free to type into the chat at any time. And it doesn't even have to be about this stuff. Any, any I mean, anything about leadership and competency-based stuff. Next, please. So um, here's a quote from a teacher. Uh, a vital early factor for the districts and schools making this change has been the engagement of teachers. For most districts, engagement comes either in response to a crisis or it comes from a long, slow process of a few teachers getting involved in training, then a few more, and then a few more. Uh, I recommend, you know, if you can avoid the crisis, avoid the crisis. That's, that's what you should do. But you should also uh, be open to the idea that this this takes a while this is a slower building process um one of the jokes uh that you hear around superintendents is that you make a three-year plan and then you work it for 10 years but um and and they laugh they laugh when that when that comes up um but the idea is just just being patient and just having conversations this long slow process Next, please. So uh, here's another quote. The universal regret of many administrators who were interviewed as I was doing these case studies is that they said they should have gotten the parents involved sooner. 
meaning that they should have begun communicating parent with parents earlier in the change process. And by communicating with, it means more than just talking to, it was about they, they regretted not getting information back from the parents. So, um, but, but a couple of things uh, that I noticed also was that no matter how early people started communicating, they said it wasn't early enough. So I seriously wonder, is, is it ever too early to start communicating? Will you ever feel as if you have communicated enough? Um, so I think maybe, yes, we, we should, uh, communication should be abundant and early, uh, but we should sort of let ourselves off the hook if, if we do that. Um, and then uh, in another interview, yet another teacher, uh, there is fear in some districts about community resistance, primarily because in two districts, vocal parents groups arose in opposition to proficiency-based learner systems. And this is true, I was there, I was in one of the districts and um, one of the things I can say is if you think you're gonna get through this process without conflict, you should think again, um, but also that, that change is a thing that you go through not um, not necessarily it's not it's not a switch that gets thrown so so you're going to have to have uncomfortable conversations so how how did the parents eventually get engaged next please so next this requires flexibility and agility next and what does agility look like i can't do that but i can do this thing that we did next please um it starts with meeting people where they are which is sort of a trite thing to say but it also starts with meeting them where they are with compassion and empathy and i know i know that compassion and empathy are are things that people talk about in church more often than they talk about in school but it's it's really true michael fallen who uh, another hero of mine, he works in Ontario a lot, um, said people are not afraid of change, they are afraid of loss. So when you're going through a change process like this and you encounter people who uh, do not wanna do the change, it's easy to dismiss them. They get called blockers. Um, you, you start talking about Luddites and well, they're just afraid of change. People who are afraid of change are sort of uh, sort of a punchline or a stereotype, but they aren't just afraid of change. They're afraid of loss. They're afraid of losing something. A new system will have new experts. It will have new ideas. It will require new competencies. Their sense of self, what does it mean to be a teacher in one system to another? Will they still be good at teaching students? Will students be uh able to function in this new system and and if you assume that they are coming from a genuine place and you address their fears it's a, a much um it's a much better way to approach engaging teachers uh it, it gives you a sense of understanding and and also it um it, it sort of prevents a bunker mentality from forming where you have different uh, different factions that forming against each other. It's, um, it was an important point to understand this. So I'm not sure where we are on time. Could you advise me, please? Yeah, we have about, oh, three more minutes of your section, but we'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A as folks think of it. Okay, so I'm gonna take, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna ask folks, attendees, you guys, you folks, you people, to think about um, as your, what, what do you think people in your school are afraid of in making this change? What is making them nervous? What is making them anxious? So I'm gonna just let us sit with that idea for a minute and then I'm gonna turn it over to Diana. 
Pretty sure that's the last thing I've got. All right, thank you, Gary. And folks can continue to respond to Gary's question, and um, maybe that's something we can address during the Q&A as well. Um, it looks like there's some, some good responses, so I'm excited to hear a little bit more about this during our Q&A time. Um, I want to dive in for a minute, though, into some of the equity concerns around personalized learning, since the topic today isn't just on how to implement competency-based learning, it's also about how to get it right for equity. So this infographic might be tricky for some of you to see, depending on your screen size and the color options on your computer. Um, but it lays out what I see as the five primary steps to take to ensure that competency-based learning is implemented equitably. So the first one is that you don't want to just have harder standards for students. You want to have deeper standards. This kind of gets at the rigor side. Um, you want to ensure that the competencies that the school creates encourages, um, that they encourage rigorous and not simply ambitious or extensive work. This will ensure that all students have the opportunity to learn deeply and well, regardless of how quickly they learn. This is starting to get at that pacing question. The second component that you really need is fair and reliable assessment. Standardized tests are going to, we know, disadvantage low-income students. They may even be culturally biased. So we want to make sure that there is a diverse slate of assessment options that are aligned to our competencies maybe even in addition to those standardized tests that we can't get away from right now. Um, the, the more school level tests, the, the classroom level tests, we can still be really careful, are aligned to our competencies, they're free from bias, and they provide a clear picture of each student's learning. This might mean getting away from what we think of as tests and look more uh, broadly at what a summative and a formative assessment might be, what a real system is like well, Gary's area of expertise here at CCE, quality performance assessment. Um, we also want to make sure, this is the third item, that there are adequate student support. Um, students, even those who enter school behind or who don't have resources or reliable support at home, must all be able to meet the competencies in a reasonable period. So differentiated support, scaffolded tools, and alternate opportunities to complete work must be available to all the students. The fourth element we see as important is multiple pathways. Students should be able to prove competency attainment by multiple measures, reachable by multiple pathways, accessible to students with all learning styles, outside commitments, interests, aspirations. This is where I've seen some pretty well-designed ways in which this is addressed by, by, again, bringing in the ability for students to show competency that they've attained outside of school. It's not always possible, but it's fantastic and much more equitable if that can be an element. And finally, um, it needs to be open to all students from all subgroups in the school. Um, we don't want competency-based learning to be stigmatized, nor something that's exclusive and that only the top track students have access to. Um, it really needs to become part of the schools and ideally the community's culture. And by no means do we think that our concerns about equity and implementing competency-based learning are limited to these five items in the infographic. We do see these as a crucial starting point. Just as another example, to, I guess to show how it goes beyond those five. Um, we actually love the new guide published by Competency Works. Um, and again, Competency Works, if I haven't mentioned it previously, um, if you go to their website, it's they're a real leader in this field, um, and I recommend their resources. Um, but their recent guide was called Designing for Equity, Leveraging Competency-Based Education to Ensure All Students Succeed. They have a lot of meat in this document, and I can't, unfortunately, dive into it entirely, but I did want to share what they identified as the nine important equity principles in designing a competency-based system. So it's about nurturing strong culture of learning and inclusivity, engaging the community, Gary was getting at this as well, in shaping new definitions of success and graduation outcomes, 
You've got to invest in adult mindsets, knowledge, and skills. Again, Gary is in line with competency work here. Um, you want to establish transparency about learning, progress, and pace. Monitor and respond to student progress, proficiency, and pace. Um, you need to respond and adapt to students using a continuous improvement process. And develop shared pedagogical philosophy based on the learning sciences. You want to support students in building skills for agency. This ties into one of our other personalized learning principles on student-driven learning. And finally, you want to ensure consistency of expectations and understanding of proficiency. Now, you might see here they use proficiency and competency rather interchangeably. Um, I highly recommend that anyone putting this work into practice read this document. It's incredibly useful and comprehensive. Um, and I do provide a link at the end of this webinar. Now, I kept mentioning we talk about pacing later, and this is the time. Um, it's a big issue, but I wanted to touch upon a few thoughts on this topic. First of all, educators are often afraid of the logistical implications of allowing students to truly move at their own pace within a competency-based system. But we're still educators. We're not letting students entirely loose. There's a reason we're keeping them, usually, in the walls of the school. So looking at the column on the right, it really emphasizes the human component, which is crucial. We need to push students toward high expectations in terms of progress, which we all know some kids for whom this would be true, sometimes require some tough love. And we need to provide them with the support that they need to be successful, not merely by providing them time, but also by actual scaffolding, um, really helping them to approach their content in a logical way and, and with some, some help along the way. Um, that might be extra tools, sometimes even helping them hone their executive functioning skills. Um, there's a reason why we really see the dispositions for learning principle as as being closely tied in with well-done competency education. Um, they need to really be able to attend to their work at a reasonable pace, even if that pace is their own and different from others in the class. So, yeah, a lot of this really is about that social-emotional learning component. Um, this is something we push for anyway, but it's extra crucial in a competency-based system. Um, at Boston Day and Evening Academy, which is renowned for its competency-based system, you'll hear students and teachers talk, honestly, more than anything else, more than you'll hear them talk about the competencies that they hit. You'll hear them talk about their relationships and the way that teachers make sure that all the students are working and doing their best work and really checking in on whatever barriers there may be to those students moving quickly through the curriculum. Um, online tools can help immeasurably, too. I, I don't necessarily think a playlist is the solution to everything, but there definitely are some tools that can make competency-based progression much easier, whether it's within the context of a learning management system or in a simple Google document that's accessible to the class. And of course, this is where it's also crucial to remember. The competencies aren't standards. They're intentionally broad and intentionally few. Now that doesn't mean we should allow any students to do seven assignments and graduate high school, but it does mean that we can really scrutinize the work that we absolutely require of all students to ensure that it's important and meaningful for every single one of them before we mandate that students demonstrate competency exactly there. Now, on the other column, I share some examples of different ways in which schools I guess it's the left column. I share examples of different ways in which schools cope with students who start out without as many skills as their peers or who may be falling behind in the competency-based progression. We definitely don't just let these kids languish. Um, some schools have periodic breaks where some students embark on you know, a student-driven project or community-based learning and, and students who need to catch up, can use that opportunity to do so. Um, and the, the, this catch up model may also include um, some of the structured breaks in the school year. Um, really uh, leveraging that work outside of the traditional school day can be a strategy by which 
you can really help those students who are really tied and committed to things outside of school um, hit their goals and, and meet those competencies. Um, flex blocks, I've seen a lot of schools institute flex blocks throughout the day where students can focus on whatever work they need to catch up on or they want to get ahead on and this can really work for students kind of on both ends of the spectrum. If they're moving very, very quickly, this is a chance for them to work on a passion project, for example. Um, and finally, um, in New Hampshire, there is a school model called uh, NG squared or no grades squared, where schools don't have actual grades in the sense of ninth grade, tenth grade. They also don't have grades in the sense of A, B, C, D. And they really focus on the needs of individual students as they progress through the school. Um, so this could be, there could be another few webinars covering this, but these are all considerations for schools or districts attempting to design a competency-based learning environment. Before I move to questions and answers, I do want to revisit the slide from the beginning around how the different principles of personalized learning work together. There's no one linchpin. They're all really necessary to the functioning of the others. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do full-on personalized learning to do competency-based education or really even vice versa, but there are some crucial components that can really support doing competency-based learning successfully. All right, so now we have the chance for some questions and answers. So you can continue to send your questions along but we also have some that we've gathered over the course of the webinar so far, and Gary and I are both available to answer these, although I'll read them um, just for simplicity, Gary, so I'll let you know if there's one pointed at you. Um, please do stick around because at the end I have some great resources to share, including the ones that I've mentioned already. So, um, Gary, there's a specific question from somebody asking, if you can give a specific example of how you addressed a loss. I think this is referring to your Michael Fullen quote. Uh, say the specific question, how would I address the what? Ha give a specific example of how you addressed a loss. Um, so, one of the one of the conversations that we had was um, this idea that in a in a in a proficiency based system teachers become more facilitators of learning uh, rather than being the expert at the front of the room and and there there were teachers there who were really um, you know, friends of mine who, who really like being the expert. I like being the expert. I'm talking to you right now. I'm an expert. It feels good. Um, but there were, there were teachers who really felt like this was a demotion. Like, if I'm a facilitator of learning, why don't we just have subs? And um, that was actually a literal quote that I, that I got. So we would, um, so we would have to have a number of conversations about, about, what the role of the teacher is and, and how facilitating learning is um, far more complicated than than you would think and it does require an expertise and the expertise they have isn't devalued because the student gets to set a portion of the agenda and um, I mean I don't I don't mean this in a belittling way at all but we had to we, we, we help these teachers find a different place to hang their esteem on i mean and this is this is a universal human thing we i really a lot of my esteem is self-esteem is based on how well do i do my work and um so we so it was it was a conversation about shifting where people find value in their work and and that sounds vague uh lengthy and almost philosophical but when you're talking about values that's that's what you're talking about you're talking about things that are vague a vague uneasiness that people feel that causes them to push back uh and then another another um loss is just the the, the sense of the loss of control of the students apparent trusting students 
is a really hard thing to do losing giving up that control and um so so there have been cases where we've where we've been talking people through you know well why do you have to have that control and there are places where we in the end we made compromises like you know student pace is not working because students are just waiting until the last minute to turn things in which which can happen because you know no educational system is going to keep a 14 year old from being a 14 year old but they created a so we created a um, compromise system which was teacher paced or faster so students could operate at the teacher pace or go faster but if they started falling behind then immediate interventions would start so that was a way of addressing their fear around trusting students uh and so in, in in one sense it's it's a sort of a uh philosophical idea of trust but the other is a very technical solution you know just changing the policy so we're not doing student paced and you know marzano is is all for um compromises that get you further was that adequate hey, Gary. Um, so we have a question here about what the impact is of, of competency-based report cards on college admissions, and some people um, sharing that this tends to be a barrier, um, or that they foresee this being a barrier as well. Um, I mentioned this before, and I actually never followed up with it. Um, so there's actually been some extensive research about this in New England, at least, um, and the New England Secondary Schools Consortium has actually recent, or I guess as recent as 2014, announced that all the public colleges and universities, as well as several private colleges um, throughout New England, um, and I think that may have excluded Massachusetts at the time. Um, it was Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Um, but they are starting to get some Massachusetts schools doing the same thing. In any case, all of these schools have vowed not to disadvantage students based on a competency-based learning transcript. In fact, um, some schools have expressed preference for these kind of transcripts, which, you know, as we've discussed here, can actually give a much more nuanced perspective of how a student learns and, and, and where that student is successful. Um, but um, I, I think this is something that's still in development. I think that while there are some private colleges and universities that are vowing, you know, the same thing and, and really open to looking equally at students with these transcripts, this is going to be part of the continued advocacy, advocacy work of those of us that really work with competency education. Um, it shouldn't be something that a single school moving toward this model has to a battle they have to fight on their own. Um, and the good news is many of you, it looks like, are coming from around New England, and there are a host of schools that have signed this pledge, let alone those who haven't signed it, who would be open to looking at a transcript um, with equal um, opportunity. Um, okay, I see another a question here um, from a science teacher, and um, that teacher uh, would like us to address how to have competency-based education while not watering down curriculum so that it loses all the content. This is, I think, a common question for content area teachers. Um, Gary, do you have any thoughts on addressing this? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, we're, this is actually very interesting. We're in Fairfax, Virginia. We're working on this very thing. We're working with a hundred social studies teachers, and um, the the um, Wendell Johnson once said, "You can't write writing. You have to write about something." And so the content is is what is is the about. There's there's an agreement about the standards or the competencies are in agreement about what it is that kids need to know 
about the story of our nation or about scientific principles. And yes, we, we are focusing away from content. We're, we're going more towards skills and then we're going even further towards 21st century skills. And that means that we have to be more, um, I mean, just because time is a finite resource, we have to be, be more exacting about what essential content is. But you can't do the skills and you can't do the 21st century skills apart from the content. And so if, if, um, if, the, if the history standard is around the theme of, of war or conflict and peace, and students can learn the basics of that theme through uh, the English Civil War and Napoleon, then um, there's, is that enough? Or do we need them to learn it through the American Civil War? Because, because we need them to have that content as well. So this is one of those decision areas where, where you as the teachers or as the schools get to, um, get to decide what is the content that's essential. Thank you, Gary. Um, I think we could dive a lot more into a lot of this, and there's a couple of questions, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to, um, but we'll make sure you have our contact information. Um, I have a few more things to bring up. Um, so the last webinar in this series has a new date. It'll now be on June 5th, but still from 3.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon, and the topic of this is flexible learning. My colleague, Carla Vigil is going to be um, our presenter on that date, and she has some great stuff to share. Um, and I hope you'll still join us despite the date change. Um, please reach out to Allison. Her contact info is on this page to make sure you signed up for the whole series if you don't remember if you are. And she and I, she or I, could also send you any of the webinars that you may have missed from previous webinars in this series. Um, finally, I did just want to mention that schools, coaches, or teachers interested in stepping a little deeper into equitable competency-based learning, or really any of our competencies, I'm um, sorry, any of our personalized learning principles and conditions, should definitely check out some of our upcoming events. These could be really re good resources for anyone from all kinds of different roles engaging with this work. Um, May 3rd, really soon, is our spring convening, and we're excited that education justice advocate Clint Smith is our keynote speaker. We have some great workshops for attendees, some networking time, even a student panel. And then this summer, we also have two CCE institutes. Our EPL institute, that gives participants a personalized opportunity to learn more about any and all of our principles, such as competency education. Um, and leave with a strong action plan for how to push their work with personalized learning further in a way that fits his or her school context. And then we have our other summer institute um, at CCE that's focused specifically on developing quality performance assessments. And this is a little more agnostic in whether you have a competency-based system, a more traditional system, or something in between. Um, either way, um, this is going to help you really get started with building a strong assessment system at your school, starting from scratch if you need to. Um, the link on this page should take you directly to our events page, where you can learn more about and sign up for all three events. I'm not sure it's clickable from where you are, but I'll include this and the other links in a follow-up email. And this last link here, I know it's a long link, so that'll definitely be in the follow-up email, is to that Competency Works white paper I referenced earlier in this webinar. It's got some super valuable material. Um, so thank you again for joining us. The fact that you took the time to be with us today speaks volumes, and I really encourage you to reach out with any further questions or comments, and we hope that we'll see you at a webinar or one of our events sometime soon. Thank you.